would like to firstly introduce myself. My name is Catania Raby. I am a newly um, installed board member of Public Narrative, and I'm very excited about this. Thank you, thank you. Um, but more important than me, I would like to introduce our amazing executive director to this historic and amazing organization, um, Jamira Alexander. Please come on up here. <laughs> Good evening. If you have ever planned a party, there are so many emotions happening right now. You're excited, you're tired, <laughs> but I am so thrilled to see your smiling faces. Um, we are, a, I'm just gonna go off script real quick. Um, we are a 30 year storytelling organization and very much so, my, a very much so, a, a huge part of my story is in this room. Everything from school, from, um, extracurriculars, sorority, family. So I want to thank you all for being a part of my own personal story, but also to be, to be here and celebrate public narrative story. So give yourselves a round of applause. So I'll talk more about how I got here um, later on in the program, but first I have to say a few thank yous. As you know, things like this are not possible without the foundations and the sponsors that support us. So I want to thank the McCormick Foundation, the Richard H. Driehaus Foundation, the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, Medill School of Journalism, and thank you to our friends here at Joby Art Center. <laughs> I met Michael Joe. Many of you may remember this building as the old Spiegel building, right? Okay, so I met Michael Joe, who is the uh, director of the building. His family owns it. I met him at a Driehaus Museum's uh, luncheon, and he invited me out. And when I stepped foot into the building, I said, Michael, I got two questions for you. One, will you join our board? And two, will you host the Turkles? And he took my hand and said, he took my hand and said, Jamira, whatever it is you need. So I'm, I'm so grateful for, for the Joe the Art Center. I want to thank our media partner, WBEZ, who was out here representing Heavy, thank you. <laughs> Michael Burke and Robert Charles, the Headline Club, my amazing board of directors, our committee who planned the party, uh, mostly our Turkle Award Committee who selected the journalists, but last but certainly not least, I'm gonna ask her to stand. She doesn't really like a whole lot of attention. I see her like looking over like a deer in the headlights. I'm gonna ask my predecessor, Miss Susie Schultz, to stand. <laughs> Susie, will you join me on stage, please? <laughs> So Susie and I were connected by another one of our board members before she became a board member, and she insisted that I meet Susie and said that she and I would hit it off, and she was absolutely positively right. I uh, operated my own business for five years, and in all the time I carried the vision, labored for the vision, when I met Susie, it became a home for the vision. asking my makeup artist was this waterproof. <laughs> so I am so super duper grateful for Susie Schultz and her many contributions to Chicago's media ecosystem. As many of you know, and if, if you know and as you love Susie, you know that she is indeed a visionary. Um, and she will give you ideas upon ideas. And I have had to sort through everything she shared with me in the last year or so. And it has been overwhelming, but in a good way. So I want to thank you. <laughs> Right now, I want to ask to the stage our MC for the evening. She's one of the first studs, Turkle chosen journalists. This lady, I just learned that she and I, and I'm going to take my seat because I'm talking too much now, but I just learned that, that we went to the same undergrad, the same uh, alma mater, Bradley University. So I want to welcome my fellow Brave to the stage, Ms. Cheryl Corley. Good evening. 
evening, everybody. Good evening. You know, this is a spotlight. Um, I just want you to know that uh, this is not spiked in any way, but uh, I will be drinking it from time to time. Um, I want to really thank Jamira for all she does in leading this organization. Let's hear it for Public Narratives President. And as she mentioned, we both went to the same college. I think you're making Bradley University very proud. Uh, you know, I really feel an affinity for her because not only did we attend and graduate uh, from the same college, but we worked at the same television station in Peoria, Illinois, decades apart. I don't think she knows this, but we were both, uh, we both uh, were directors at the station. You didn't know that either. <laughs> Which I, uh, I recently found that out. So we definitely have this kind of deep cosmic connection, right? And you know, our hair is the same, and you know. <laughs> I was like, we're twins. <laughs> and uh, destined to come together for this moment, I think. So thanks to all of you who have come out tonight to support great journalism. And I'm, I'm going to try to uh, work my mic here. You know I'm in radio, so if it gets too you know, weird, I need peop my spotters in the audience to go, Cheryl, tone it down or something like that. <laughs> my spouse. Um, so anyway, I'm, I'm really glad that you've come here to support uh, Public Narrative's mission of diversifying voices in the media and the news and, and really connecting community uh, groups with the media. And Public Narrative has been doing that work since 1989, 1989. Our thanks, of course, to uh, Hank DeZutter and Tom Clark and Susie Schultz, who was up here. And now to the very accomplished Jamila Alexander for making all of that happen. You know, 25 years ago, this organi organization came up with the idea to honor journalists with the Studs Terkel Award and to recognize reporters who not only were, you know, kind of get the facts straight kind of people and get the substance of the story, but who, like Studs, were people who were going to listen, who were going to engage, who were going to report, and most importantly, pay attention to the voices of those who might not ordinarily be on the front page or at the top of the broadcast. Yeah. You know, uh, Studs put it this way. He said, these are journalists who report on people who make Chicago, who report on news that's bottom up. So tonight, our 25th year of the Studs Turkle Awards. You know, we're going to be uh, really celebrating some very impressive people for the incredible work they do. And they will be joining a really uh, a stellar group of Studs Terkel Award winners. There have been uh, five news organizations that have won this award. There have been 79 uh, individual journalists who have won this award. So I talked to a, a few of them about Studs and the Turkle Award, uh, Shirley Jihad from the class of 2002, formerly of WBEZ. She told me that getting the award was such a thrill because Studs was the people's journalist who found poetry in the voice of the common man and brought it forward. Last year, Michael Green, an Associated Press reporter, called the Turkle Award his Pulitzer. And 2001 winner Martha Irvine with the Associated Press says, without a doubt, this is the award that journalists cover, and we know our stories would be lifeless and empty without the voices of the really vibrant people that filled this city. You know, during his lifetime, Studs Terkel often said, what America suffers from is what he describes as a sort of national Alzheimer's disease. So he wrote books such as Working and Hard Times and his Pulitzer winner, uh, the Good War, to help kind of jog the nation's memory. And many of you here tonight may have read some of those books, or maybe you heard him when he was on uh, WFMT radio, where he held court for more than 40 years, interviewing a fascinating parade of people. And WFMT has an archive on his website if you'd like to listen to some of those. Of course, Studs Terkel loved to talk, right? <laughs> 
And he had this really incredible, legendary memory. And as I get older, I really realize how incredible that is. <laughs> and, but one of his greatest talents was his ability to listen, because he was like a, a, a musician. His interviews were, were jazz-like. Often, he didn't have any written questions. He'd just pick up a riff and kind of improvise. And interestingly enough, his first book, which he published when he was 45 years old, was The Giants of Jazz, celebrating the music of jazz artists. And the oral histories dealing with the lives of ordinary people would come a decade later. You know, for some of us, Studs Terkel was a friend, or perhaps a person we just looked up to and admired. Uh, but here's what's really important to know. Stud Sterkel had a great sense of humor. He had a passion for people. He had a deep desire to make the world a better place, one story at a time. And you know, he had this tough guy nickname, right? And the raspy voice that went with it. And he loved red socks and red gingham shirts. Go figure, I just don't get that. But I know that probably some of you in this crowd have your red socks on tonight, right? So just be proud, be proud. <laughs> so here's, here's how it works. Anybody can nominate a journalist to win the turkle. And in the early days, Studge chose the award winners. And these days, a committee of former winners does that work. And this year, those folks had their work really cut out for them because there were more than 70 nominations. And Stud said that the average American has an indigenous intelligence, a native wit, and it's only a question of piquing that intelligence. And tonight's winners do just exactly that with the quality of their work and the excellence of their storytelling they peak that intelligence, and they elevate the voices, and they get the word out. So we're gonna have awards in a few categories this evening, and it's time for me to stop talking <laughs> and to meet the winners. So, a video first. I hear about a certain person who may be gold, and I go to see that person, and now they gold prospector digs and digs and digs, and I talk, and they talk. And out comes for the prospector tons of all kinds of ore. I got to edit and cut and change, and out comes these eight pages of gold. Deborah Douglas. Deborah Douglas is most inspired by reading between the lines of traditional news coverage and seeing how other institutions craft policy, her great migration roots, that journey that millions of African Americans made from the South to the North, uh, they propel her to make connections that explain who we are, how we are, and why we are. You know, Deborah, she's a powerhouse. I just have to put it that way. She's the managing editor of the award-winning outlet MLK 50, Justice Through Journalism. She has served as a senior leader with the Op-Ed Project, the organization founded to change who writes history. And she's been a leader with Chicago's Youth Narrating Our World, designed to get young people engaged in public media. Oh yeah, and she's also a journalism professor. <laughs> so please welcome community media recipient Deborah Douglas to the stage. for speechifying, so I have my phone, everyone. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Public Narrative and the Turkle Selection Committee for the consideration of my body of work, especially themes that center people and not power. That work has included reporting, writing, and editing about everything from health disparities, innocence, and wrongful convictions to the erasure of black women from social policy, 
which actually was cited in the New York Times, I'm proud to say. Uh, that solid body of work even includes a misbegotten publication called Fluff, which was exactly what it sounds like. <laughs> For real talk, despite the mild sauce that's running through my veins, I never thought that I would ever be Chicago enough to win a Turkel Award. <laughs> when Jeremiah told me, my face was cracked. <laughs> um, I really admire previous Studs Turkel Award winners, and um, I'm honored to be um, among your ranks at this moment. Um, I read your work, I listen to your work, I study and observe your photos, and I cheer when you win. When I think about why I do what I do and who gets the benefit from it, I think of uh, an iconic poem by Margaret Walker Alexander. It's called For My People, and it was published in the 1940s. I'd like to quote a bit of this poem by Alexander, who, like myself, attended Northwestern University, because it gets me to a notion of journalism that I find to be a fallacy today. And, and I'm learning this more and more as I break form and break the rules in all the right places. And that notion is the notion of objectivity. This notion honestly has been wielded in the practice of journalism as a proxy for the white male privilege default. And it blinds us and it makes equity and inclusivity, the challenges of our time, all the more difficult. The insistence on looking past and failing to consider to narrate my, you, and our audience's fault lines is what drives me to keep showing up in my own story so I can move past default mode and help tell unheard and under-amplified stories. So what amounts to a critique and a tribute to black life, Alexander wrote, quote, for my people walking blindly, spreading joy, losing time, being lazy, sleeping when hungry, shouting when burdened, drinking when hopeless, tied, and shackled and tangled among ourselves by the unseen creatures who tower over us omnisciently and laugh, for my people blundering and groping and floundering in the dark of churches and schools and clubs and societies, associations and councils and committees and conventions, distressed and disturbed and deceived and devoured by money-hungry, glory-craving leeches, preyed on by facile force of state and fad and novelty, by false prophet and holy believer, for my people standing, staring, trying to fashion a better way from confusion, from hypocrisy and misunderstanding, trying to fashion a world that will hold all the people, all the faces, all the Adams and Eves, and their countless generations. Let a new earth rise. Let another world be born. Let a bloody peace be written in the sky. Let a second generation full of courage issue forth. Let a people-loving freedom come to growth. That's what I'm trying to write about. <laughs> I'm almost done. I got two more minutes. <laughs> okay, so the reason is because the stakes are high. How high? Atiana Jefferson high? Sandra Bland high? Right? Rakia Boyd high. Like, so high, Fannie Lou Hamer told us. Rosa Parks told us. Ida B already told us. That's how high it is. And I work as many jobs as I have to so I can tell these stories and stories of joy. And if you have met me, you know I do work all the jobs. <laughs> <laughs> I'm keenly interested in understanding the underlying structures that allow, quote, glory craving leeches to thrive and people, especially children, to be, quote, preyed on by facile forces force of state and fad. I believe that between purpose-driven and driven to distraction activities of, quote, councils and committees and conventions lies deeply structural answers to the problems they're trying to solve and the institutions they're attempting to build. I believe that my parents' great migration dream for me is to, quote, fashion a better way from confusion, from hypocrisy, and misunderstanding through the gift I've been given and nurtured by my family, my community, and my beautiful friends in the audience tonight. I'd like to close in thanking my mama, who's not here, Mrs. Ernestine P. Stewart, for believing in me and testifying to the Holy Ghost power of making a little girl's journalism dream come true. I'd like to thank the Taylor family and their home library full of books from generations who attended HBCUs, because those books showed me how I can re-presence and center marginalized voices and many, many stories. And Ms. Smith, who is now Dijanaba Abu Bukhari, my Afrocentric primary school music teacher, who made me crave stories for my people. And Mr. Barish, who by telling me the story of the Holocaust and his people, hooked me on the craft of story and seeing people, really seeing people. 
the Ape Project, Michelle, I see you, Teresa. <laughs> And finally, to Wendy C. Thomas, my partner in crime at MLK 50 Justice Through Journalism, where we do it for the people. <laughs> and that includes holding power to account when they abuse lower income people, fail to pay folks a living wage, prioritize profit and destruction over people, and falsely narrate the truth of their lives because to do so accurately will reveal disparate impacts, faulty framing, and structural obsolescence that is planned for some, but not all, and you know who. Almost done. For the uninitiated, we launched MLK 50 Justice Through Journalism on April 4th, 2017. It's a one-year project determined to keep the economic story straight 50 years since Dr. King was assassinated. We are having an impact, and I am grateful. And I wouldn't be telling the truth if I didn't say no thank you to hostile newsrooms that depresents black women, a, a term I coined, you can quote me, to kill our journalistic spirits. Just look at the stats, okay? You don't have to believe me, look at the numbers. And to that needlessly rigid sixth grade teacher who when she graded my, my paper on my life's vocation and I said I wanted to be a great Negro journalist and I capitalized it in, and she downgraded me to a C, no thank you to her either. <laughs> but because I'm apparently passionately stubborn and refuse to disappear as my social programming as a black, lower middle class raised, curvy, dark skinned black woman suggests, and because I really, really love what I do, which includes teaching and launching new and expert voices into the public conversation, I will end with a thought by another favorite writer. Quote, each of us has that right, that possibility to invent ourselves daily. If a person does not invent herself, she will be invented. So to be bodacious enough to invent ourselves is wise. Thank you. <laughs> So this feels much like a graduation, and in true graduation fashion, I'm gonna ask that instead of clapping at the beginning when you hear the honorees' names, if you will wait till after, only because you have to hear the video, okay? All right. I think people are hungry for something, a cause. Basically, there was a cause. So there's no rule of thumb anymore about people and labels. I don't like labels anymore. So I like issues and individuals and what they do. Our next Community Media Award recipient is Britt Julius. <laughs> Britt is a writer. She's an editor, an essayist, and storyteller for publications like The New York Times, Vogue, Bon Appetit, Esquire, Elle, Women's Health, and others. She is a hard-working, <laughs> creative young woman. She currently writes a weekly column for the Chicago Tribune, serves as the editorial director of Cancer Wellness Magazine, and previously edited for Vice Media's electronic music publication, Thump. As a creator, Britt's work focuses on the intersection of art, culture, race, feminism, and politics. And she's a firm believer in the underground, the avant-garde, and the underdog. <laughs> Please welcome Community Media Award recipient, Britt Julius, to the stage. Um, uh, I want to... Um, thank Public Narrative and uh, thank the committee um, for choosing me. I, this is the sort of award that I always assumed that I would never get as a freelance writer, someone who focuses on arts and culture, who grew up going to nightclubs and raves and talking about those scenes in particular, but um, I always wanted to be a writer and I always felt like the people that I met and knew and understood from those communities, people who um, were not white, people who were not straight, people who didn't identify on you know the gender binary, they deserved to have their stories told. And so, um, 
um, those are the types of stories that I like to tell, not just about music. I talk about art and politics and other things as well. But um, so I, it's just something I never assumed would actually come to me or happen to me. And I'd just sort of be in the fringes um, in my apartment um, writing stories and then sort of sending them out into the world and being very online and whatnot. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so I didn't really prepare a traditional speech um, uh, when I am feeling very insecure or um, I have uh, imposter syndrome, which happens a lot. Uh, um, I will oftentimes write things from the perspective of what would you say to yourself if you were trying to encourage yourself? And so um, this is a sort of a advice piece that I did. Um, I'm also a storyteller in Chicago, part of the Live Lit community. I do lots of shows. Don't know if you all are ever familiar with that, but you should go to a show if you haven't. Um, and so this is kind of written in that vein. So if you'll allow me, um, I'm gonna kind of perform something rather than uh, just give a traditional speech. circumvent the weight of their expectations. What they want is for you to perform to the limitations of their mind. What they want is for you to rely on the flimsy promise of their stereotypes and hatred. But you are more than that, you always have been. You recognize deep within them some impure thing that didn't want you to succeed in life for they were weak in their own lives. A man, my teacher, once told me he gave me a lower score for the semester because he didn't think I was worthy of something better, even if I had the scores to get an A, which I did. What I'm doing right now, he said, is preparing you for the real world, where girls like you work real hard and only amount to the levels that other people will give you. You should be thanking me, he said. This happened, my mother knows she's in the audience. For see, it wasn't about the supposed obviousness of my limitations, but the assuredness that he felt in the limitations that were going to be placed on me. And so I've realized that my job is to navigate around the stop gaps of other people's minds. My job is to see the light at the end of the tunnel always. My job is to always keep climbing even as other people's racism and sexism and ableism and everything else blows fiercely through the air around me because I am the only fighter in this fight. And so I say to myself and others to protect yourself and keep climbing. Circumvent your place. 10 years ago, a man at a job I once had told me, you need to know your place and stay in it. He said, ambition is unbecoming of a woman. He said, you think you deserve to rise, but that's really not true. He said, eight years ago, 10 years ago, this one singular man, all of these things, and I almost believed him circumvent their well-meaning. All of this will be too hard for you, other people said to me. All of this can't be done from the second city, from the quiet of your broken down apartment, from the sheer force of will you may exhibit now in this young age, but you'll surely lose over time. All of this may be good, they said, but this little project, this blog of yours can't amount to anything more than the peak of where you are right now. My friend and I were sitting in a mostly empty bar, and I was there not as a friend, but as a young admirer from afar. It was a literary reading, and I attended with one of my best friends, another young woman, an aspiring writer. And like mine, we had dreamed about what it would mean to actually be a writer. It was us and it was these two women at this event, women that we had looked up to. It was us and them and in the quiet shadows of the nearly empty space for this literary reading, which no one but us attended, they said and turned to us, you should really turn back now. You should just give it all up. Just save yourself. My friend left in tears, but I left in righteous fury. All of this will be too hard for you, they said, and yet I kept going. What choice do we have except to keep going? What choice do we have except to radically, ridiculously, righteously pursue what can be ours and what should be ours? You either take them at their word or you believe those silly little dreams of yours matter. And so I chose the latter. Circumvent the conventions of time of worlds rooted in the past. What I was told when I first began to pursue writing, to pursue journalism, to pursue poetry and essay writing was that this was a man's world and the way I saw about doing things had no place. I was told you needed approval by certain people and you needed to be published in certain places and you need to go to certain events and you needed to lose a part of yourself and emerge as one with the hive mind of the writing world. But it never felt right in my gut and my gut had never steered me wrong before. 
I began as an intern who turned into a blogger, who turned into a writer, and the only truth of the world I could accept was I only have this life, and I only have these moments, and I only have this one mind. To compromise even a little bit of who I am in the very core of my being would be to spit on the sacrifices, memories, struggles, and fights of my ancestors to get me to this very moment right here and now in this room, this second, and this second, and this one too. Who am I to reject family, to reject sacrifice, to reject myself so I may fit in when the world has already told me I will always stand out. The journey was not pretty or pleasant, but it was mine. That was true. The journey was not one of luck, but I was lucky to believe in it and not everything else. The journey was not short, and neither am I. Why be the things they want you to be instead of the pure, good, unique thing you already are? Circumvent your age and the wrinkles of the present. It is not too late. It is never too late. Think of your mind 10 years ago or even five years ago or even one year ago or even one month ago or even one day ago or even one second ago and think what you have gained in those moments beyond the scope of time. Weigh the breath of your mind expanding into the vast possibilities only certain with life lived and keep going. At 20 years old, I thought it was too late because I was not interning in New York City. I did not go to the right schools. I was scraping by with scholarships and student loans and work study. At 25 years old, I thought it was too late because I worked a day job at a coupon factory selling people crap goods they didn't need. I thought it was too late because I was not making the sort of work I wanted to make and was not living the sort of life I wanted to live. I thought it was too late because I had not reached certain markers of life and love, of travel and of exploration, of adventure and of beauty, of accomplishment. I thought it was too late because they told me it was too late. At 30 years old, on my my birthday, I thought it was too late, even as I stood on top of a mountain in the black forest of Germany, finally living and loving, finally traveling and exploring, finally soaking in the beauty of adventure and life. I thought it was too late because we must remind ourselves every day, I must remind myself every day that what I have is good enough and what we can have is not out of reach. And so I remember these things and say to myself again and again, if it all is too much, that I must circumvent the trauma of my limbs, escape the expectations of this body, and remember that my mind is crisp and intangible. My mind is an unbodied body, a thing unthinkable, a secret. I have to navigate the deviances of the world manifest as mere ple pleasures. I must remember that these other bodies are just other bodies, they're other people, and even if they work hard to control and destroy my body and other bodies, bodies as if it is their God-given right. It isn't. It is not. And they are not. I matter more than their body if their body aims to destroy me. And you matter more than their body if their body aims to destroy your own. There is a measurement of goodness in the world. We all have value. Our human deserve rights. But maybe they forfeit when they destroy others, and especially when they try to destroy you. And so I fight for myself. No one knows me but me. I wish I could know myself better, could love myself better, could keep my myself safer, but there are limits to other people and limits to myself, and so I will do the thing that sometimes I can't do for myself and tell the stories of other people. I will be the brave, pure thing that I want for myself because this world is unfair, but maybe I can make it more fair for everything else and everyone else. I dance, I manifest total freedom, I take total control over myself and my words and the work I produce and release into the world. I must eviscerate the struggles of the mind, look deep within my body, root around the darkest, nastiest, ugliest bits, and claim them as my own proudly. Permanence is not permanent. You get through this, and even when permanence feels likely, remember that you can and have and will. This is your purpose, your life, your drive. This is what you have always been meant to do. There is beauty and value in the stories we want to tell and the ways we want to tell them in the time I came to tell them, in the effort we take to tell them. And so I see in you, I believe in you, I believe in this world and this future. Thanks. Never too late, as they say, eh? Never too late. 
And um, my mom was a teacher, so you know, some of those teacher stories were very disappointing to me. <laughs> but, okay. <laughs> okay, that's good. That's good. But but what it also what it also um, uh, showed both you and Miss Douglas uh, is still you know how to rise. Still you rise. Still you rise. We have another video to look at. They are what they are because of what they do. Now, all these people dealt with some, had some sense of community. Everyone, as he, she recalls that youth, that vigor, that spirit, out beyond self, becomes that person again, becomes our chronic. Our next community media award recipient is Jerome McDonald. He's very studs-like. He had that, you know, he had a long radio show as well. He's a friend and a colleague, and I've known him for many years, and his, as he likes to say, uh, if you look in the dictionary, you can find his picture under public radio lifer. <laughs> he is an avid and, shall I say, ferocious bicyclist with a subdued but wicked sense of humor. And Jerome believes broadcasting's highest calling is to bring people together to make a difference. He was the host of WBEZ's Global Affairs Program, Worldview, from 1994. From 1994 until earlier this month. And before that, he produced the international show, Midday with Sandra Gare. Um, Jerome is now WBEZ's environmental reporter, so we'll be keeping our ear out for that. And over the past 25 years, Jerome kept Chicago area folks abreast of what's happening in the rest of the world. And he helped wipe out that national Alzheimer's disease that Studs Terkel said we suffer from by breaking down global issues, connecting people, and spurring them to action. Jerome's interviewed influential and world leaders like Jimmy Carter, Condoleezza Rice, Kofi Annan, but also peasant organizers and environmental activists and social entrepreneurs. You know, this award goes to journalists who, in the spirit of Studs Terkel, and I'll say it, give voice to the voiceless. <laughs> you know, perhaps it's a hackneyed phrase, but I can't think of anyone, anyone, who has given people that we often don't hear from a platform to thoughtfully discuss their ideas and their issues on a more consistent basis than Jerome. I am thrilled to present this award. Let's welcome Jerome McDonald. Thank you, Cheryl. Um, so, like, uh, when I started doing Worldview, uh, you know, I was pretty nervous about it. And I mean, you know, I want to say, uh, I should have worked harder on my speech. Uh, the previous awardees were really awesome. And um, in my defense, I'm doing five public events this week. I've got to speak at all of them. Um, but anyway, Cheryl uh, is, is someone, I, I, like she said, we've known each other forever. I do remember when Cheryl came to the station, I, uh, but Cheryl kind of was my boss. And um, she, uh, when I first started doing the program, she did my first air check. You know, when you kind of, in radio, you kind of take an air check and you go in with your boss and you sit there and you listen to it and you have to uh, evaluate yourself and see how you're doing. And I, you know, I was filled with self-doubt, of course, and, and thought I sucked. And, uh, and I sat down with Cheryl and I thought, she is really gonna give me the hammer. And uh, she sat down, she's really nice. She was really encouraging. She was really nice. And um, uh, you don't even remember that, do you, Cheryl? <laughs> you do not remember that. I know how it goes. 
I would like to thank the nice people from Worldview, my Worldview community who are here. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Edie Rabinowitz, uh, producer number two, I like to call her, uh, Gretchen Helfrich, producer number one, Alexandra Solomon, Julian Haida, the final producer, um, and the long-suffering Steve Bynum, who, who worked with me the longest. <clears throat> I want to thank everybody who participated in my selection. Thank you, Natalie Moore, for uh, helping me out there in the selection committee. Um, I will t I, you know, I uh, I could say a lot of things about, you know, Worldview. It's been on for 25 years. It, it had a lot of missions. But I think, in essence, uh, we've been trying to, we, to reinterpret what global is. Um, global is not something that is out there. Global is something that is here. Global is something that is here. And, uh, you know, I think we all have uh, a set of common aspirations and rights and uh, I think that was an idea that resonated with listeners and they appreciated hearing about uh, that in our media. And I am proud to have had guests on from every possible community and global identity, uh, people who originally hail from Lithuania or Honduras. I had so many people on from the former Yugoslavia, Tibetans, uh, Nigerians, Filipinos, the amazing Ethiopian community, I love them, the Syrian Americans, the Cambodians, the South Asian community, I'm doing a wonderful event for the South Asian community tomorrow night, uh, come to the Field Museum. Uh, the indigenous, uh, in, lots of indigenous people, Korean Americans, so many others. Um, our global identity is baked into this community and I've been proud and happy to share a light on who we really are. I try my best to make people feel heard and respected, and I'm very happy to have an award with Studs Terkel's name on it. I wanted to, I, I didn't put this in the, my thing, but I'm gonna digress anyways. I taught, you know, we did a series on Puerto Rico. For a year we talked about Puerto Rico every one once a week uh, under the wisdom of Steve Bynum, and the, um, we talked to Chacha Jimenez once, the, who, was the, uh, who was with the Young Lords and was in quite a lot of trouble back in the day and he was frequently getting arrested. And we've got a bust of Studs Terkel in our, in our studio where I'm interviewing him. And I know that Studs Terkel bailed him out of jail once. Um, and, and, he, and I asked him about that and he goes, no, oh, he bailed me out of jail. They were rearresting him and rearresting Chacha Jimenez uh, for his activism. Uh, repeatedly, he goes, oh no, he, 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 he bailed me out of jail you know, three, four, five times. <laughs> I was like, wow, I am gonna, maybe, uh, you know, BEZ could get, get a bail fund thing out. We could start doing that. I, I think that would be cool. <laughs> there are a lot of people who, um, who get arrested and, and maybe like a journalism slush fund, we could get, get, get some unjustly imprisoned people uh, out of jail. And, uh, you know, in college, I uh, did, in radio class, uh, I got to do a report on any program we wanted, and I did it, I, I did my report on Studs Terkel, and it was really the first time I thought deeply about uh, what a radio program is, and I pulled apart in my head what was really going on there, and then there was a lot there. Um, when I started hosting Worldview, I tried to build on uh, several sources of inspiration. I knew I could not be Studs Terkel, I, that is not me. Studs was a world-class raconteur, and I am not even an extrovert, I'm kind of an introvert. <laughs> um, but I thought that I could be like Studs in that I could invite uh, adventurous independent voices into my space and I could uh, open up this space and, and make it exciting to, to help us redefine ourselves. And I knew I, there were a lot of inspirations for me. I knew I could not be as fluid as Mr. Ken Davis who always was on the air, who I was watching uh, frequently. Um, but I hoped that I could be present for the guests like Ken always was and really focused on the guests like Ken was and I knew I couldn't be uh, like Sandra Gare. Uh, Sandra Gare was impetuous. She was my uh, opposite. We worked together for many years. Um, she had this silky delivery, and I'm, you know, a little clunkish. But the, um, I knew I could move the ball forward on her vision of peace. 
And I tried my best to take these uh, pieces and bits of inspiration and uh, do something with them on the air. Um, I got a message from uh, Linda Paul after my last Worldview show, and uh, she wrote to me and said, Worldviews went been one of the most soulful, connected to the people programs I've ever had the good fortune to hear. And uh, I can live with that. <laughs> Thank you. video. They've been active in one way or another in a world outside themselves, outside their own personal interests. We're more and more into communications, plural, but less and less in communication. Our final community media award recipient is Annie Sweeney of the Chicago Tribune. <laughs> Annie Sweeney has covered Chicago and its suburbs for nearly her entire career, but now she is on the Tribune's criminal justice team, covering the impact of violence in Chicago and policies to address it. She's reported for the Chicago Sun-Times, the Daily South Town, the City News Bureau. Annie, you've reported for everybody, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> she joined the Tribune in 2009, and as part of her reporting on the criminal justice beat, it hasn't been all about Chicago. She's visited other U.S. cities, including L.A., to research policing and violence there. She's done some very important stories, putting a spotlight not just on the voiceless, but the ignored. Uh, for example, Annie's uh, documented the unsolved strangulation murders of women in the city that dates back 20 years. And she's also investigated gaps in the gun permitting system in Illinois. Like I said, strong stories. Please welcome to the stage 2019 Studs Terkel Community Media Award recipient, Annie Sweeney. Thank you. Um, I, I want to thank the folks at Public Narrative uh, for giving me something so inspiring to live up to in this award. Um, when I read the description, I really thought, like, right on, this is exactly what good journalism is. And it's really what I love most about my job. It's what happens out on the street, you know, meeting people, hanging out on blocks, getting to really feel the pulse of the city. I also want to thank all the winners here. Um, I think you show me and Chicago really how creative and distinctive um, journalism can be, and I'm inspired. And a really big thanks to Mary Schmeek, who I cannot see because these lights are bright, but um, you know, she nominated me for this, and I gotta say, if you get nominated for a storytelling award by Mary Schmeek, it's like that's reward enough in many ways. So. Um, and then there's, I feel a lot of gratitude for working in so many newsrooms, like Cheryl mentioned. City News, Daily Southtown, I don't know if you mentioned that one, but yes, people up north just don't get it. Um, the Sun-Times, the Trib, um, all such distinctive places, but um, also every single one filled with like some of the most interesting and quirky people I've ever met, you know, because journalists are really one-of-a-kind kind of people. They're so real, so human. We're so interested in the world. Um, but for nearly all that time, you know, I covered crime and violence, again, as Cheryl mentioned. And, you know, not always joyful moments, clearly. So I've really come to understand that tension between having to tell a story, you know, landing on somebody's block, their door, you know, during one of the most difficult times for them. So the stakes have always felt super high. You know, would we get it right? You know, is it gonna be fair? 
what are the facts? Are we gonna be first, right? Should we tweet this? Um, and then beyond that, there's the truth, right? Like, are we reflecting this community? You know, and what does this particular thing mean, this shooting mean for the city? Um, so I think um, in reflecting on this, you know, I feel like it, we can really be guided by Studs Terkel, right? His deep, unending curiosity, his love of a good, long conversation, his generosity with his subjects. I think that's how we'll land on the stories with the most dignity and hope. And of course, these stories take longer. You need to build relationships, show up more than once, get rejected and turned away. You have to be present and quiet and listen. So I have to thank my bosses over all these years, including three trib editors who are here. Again, I can't see you, Matt. Oh, I can see Phil, Dan and where Phil, Matt and Dan, yeah, who are here tonight, who have always supported me, like assuring me that these stories should be told and encouraging me to follow my curiosity. I also want to thank my reporter colleagues at the Tribune, who this year organized us into a union, so that we, <laughs> right, um, you know, so that we, the workers, um, could have a say-so in how to protect and create the conditions that support such good journalism. And I don't have to tell anybody in this room like how much good journalism matters these days. Um, and the last thing I'll say is that good storytelling for me has always been a little bit of a risk. I, I don't know if that's the right word, I, but it's just, it's difficult sometimes. Um, but I wanna end with a huge thank you to all the people out there who I took an even bigger risk. The community groups, the organizers, activists, outreach workers, survivors, residents, victims, those caught up in the violence, law enforcement, everybody who ever welcomed me and helped me find the story. Thank you. Congratulations. Kids have a cause again, it seems. And we have a young generation of good, decent people who have the faintest idea what the past was like. And so you've got these people who are storytellers, and my hope is they'll be heard. Our next Turkle Award recipient of the evening is in another category, but a uh, Turkle Award that Studs would probably love. It's the Uplifting Voices Award. And um, Public Narratives first presented uh, the first Uplifting Voices Award in 2014. It's an award that goes to anyone who, in their work, elevates the voices of the community. And this year it goes to Jeff McCarter of Free Spirit Media. The organization works with teens and young adults in communities of color on Chicago's south and west sides. It provides them with a uh, comprehensive foundation in media literacy and hands-on media production experience. Jeff says he was both delighted by the craft of storytelling, but also troubled by the limited diversity in and access to the media industry. And it was that dynamic which challenged him to seek out alternate approaches to media making and community building, which led to the formation of Free Spirit Media. And he says he's most inspired by the creative, uh, the creativity, the passion, and the purpose of emerging media makers, the journalists and the storytellers who have grown with Free Spirit Media and help advance Free Spirit Media's mission of both transforming media as well as transforming society. So please welcome 2019 Studs Terkel Uplifting Voices Award recipient, Jeff McCarter. Wow. Um, thank you, Cheryl. I'm really blown away and humbled to be amongst these fellow honorees from this year and, uh, and 
the Studs Terkel Award passed, 25 years, the luminaries, um, inspirations. And, and Studs was a, an inspiration uh, when I first heard his voice and heard his work. And, uh, and then at some point in the late 90s, I was lucky enough to get to do a story where I went to his home and uh, interview him for WTTW and just was in awe of his presence. And, you know, he had the, the red socks and the, the red thing, and the, I go more blue, um, but <laughs> in Stud's honor. Um, so I just want to say a, a couple things. Um, I'm so grateful for this honor on behalf of the whole Free Spirit Media family, because Free Spirit Media has been a journey amongst so many. Uh, for so long, 18 years. Um, I want to thank Jamira and what you're doing is awesome and Susie before you and what you did is awesome and, and you know, just shout out to, to Tom and to Hank and it's, it's, it, you know, it's quite a journey starting something and, and seeing it go forth is you don't know what's going to happen when you start something, and and uh, and no one really ever starts anything because we just come into the world and take that breath and see where it takes you. Um, I want to recognize my family who came out tonight. Um, I'm so blessed to have um, my mom and dad here, my sister, my wife and son. Uh, Louise stayed at home uh, because she's not feeling great and she's got homework. Uh, <laughs> um, when, uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> um, take a break, kids. Um, I learned differently, but you know, it's, it's funny on the, on the family front, uh, when Jamira called a couple weeks back, with the good news, and uh, I remember telling Catherine, um, and Roland overheard us, and he was like, "What? Who is who's that? Studs Turkle? What? It, it, who's that guy?" And and he's like, "I'm gonna go tell my friends at school." But there was an embargo uh, on the uh, on the award, so I was uh, we, Catherine and I we we pivoted a, bi a bit and. Uh, Studs Terkel turned into Skip Tucker. <laughs> so we were safe, but but now Roland knows who who Studs Terkel is. Um, I also want to uh, recognize and thank um, my my dear Free Spirit Media family and colleagues who came out tonight, Glennens and Taya and Kita, and uh, it really means a lot to have you here. And uh, the whole Free Spirit Media family, which is, you know, we've worked with over 7,000 young people, and uh, we have a team of 25 uh, really dedicated media activists and educators and uh, youth development uh, um, believers. Um, so speaking of that, Free Spirit Media, let me just paint the picture. 18 years, uh, 7,000 participants, instilling, like Cheryl said, and a foundation of media literacy, which, you know, is that light bulb moment, that peel back the curtain uh, idea that, that um, when you understand the power of media, you are no longer a gullible or vulnerable or susceptible consumer that's being pushed around. You are you have power. You, you, you can say, I'm a critical thinker. I'm an independent thinker. I can filter that message and layer it across other intersectional messages and understand that, that I have a story to tell as well. And as you learn and you listen, you are also empowered to say, um, I'm a producer. I'm a creator. I'm going to contribute to to this world while I'm here. Um, yeah. 
So besides media literacy, Free Spirit Media is a maker space. I, we are about creating media. And uh, in our time, it's way over 10,000 stories. And uh, you could say <laughs> we're a media conglomerate. <laughs> Uh, but a nonprofit <laughs> version thereof. And uh, we are working in journalism. We have the Real Shy newsroom for young adults on the west side in the original Sears Tower. Uh, we're doing documentary films, scripted narrative films. Sports broadcasting is actually where it all started. Um, the, the program Hoops High in 2000, which preceded Free Spirit, was, uh, you know, Early on, people were like, hoops high, What's that? is that like hoop dreams? And uh, I love hoop dreams. Hoop dreams was a very inspirational film for me, but it was a documentary made by three white guys that came into the west side and the Cabrini Green, Green area to follow some basketball players around, and they did a beautiful job, but, but hoops high is a program made by young people on the west side that are telling their own stories of games. And now we've been on CAN TV, Chicago Access Network Television for um, 19 years. It preceded Free Spirit and uh, over 700 telecasts. So, you know, the stories are many. The time keeps on ticking. Um, the documentaries and public service announcements that the young people in Free Spirit Media have created are some of the most powerful pieces of media I've ever seen. Um, they're strong technically, but they are life-changing in their content. And, and some of the stories that have surfaced were ahead of their time or just where you know, someone said something about um, voice the voiceless. Everybody has a voice. Everybody has a voice. It's just like, how can you activate that? How, you know, what are your access to tools and to, and, and to some, some positive supports to, to get it out there? Um, so stories on restorative justice before that was a well-known term or uh, food justice, uh, Hungry for Change, a documentary um, was was created in 2004, and and you know helped to put um, uh, you know, some of these issues onto the map, uh, which are you know ongoing issues. So, in conclusion, <laughs> um, the FSM family is vast. Uh, the universe that we're in is vast, but it's an interconnected ecosystem. I, I look out. I think. You know, just the layers of this city. Uh, somebody said, Jameer, what did you say this building was before? So Spiegel. So like, so and here it is, an art center, uh, and here we are. And Free Spirit Media, based on the west side, uh, in the original Sears Tower, the 1905 Sears Tower that Sears left in the early 70s, the a disinvestment from that community, and it sat dormant, and and. Now it's reopened and it's, it's a beacon. And I would just say we are in a layered, nuanced, beautiful, heavy space. And uh, I love you know, the, the, the global connection. You know, sometimes youth media, people are like, oh, youth media, that's cool. That's cool what the youth do. The youth are people <laughs> and they grow up. And, and so, like, and they don't like uh, being marginalized or ghettoized into, into like, oh, that's nice, youth media, because they are, they are storytellers, too. And, uh, and I love how Free Spirit Media has evolved in that we used to be teen-based, but young people were just like, hey, we've got more to do. And, and so now it's teens and young adults, and they are starting their own companies. They are becoming the journalists. They are creating just incredibly powerful content. A, a young man, Montel Williams, who I was just in Los Angeles with 10 years ago, nine years ago, uh, we won an Emmy Award for a PSA we made. Um, and it was, a, 
it was a Chicago Midwest grown up Emmy and people were very upset when Montel came up there and they're, they're like, that, that, he's a teenager and was like, but, but he had collaborated and written and acted in a, a piece and now he's, he's a filmmaker and um, that's what's up. There's so much more and, and yet, you know, I, I think about the, the truth from the fellow honorees tonight, what you've said, and, and I know we have another to come, and I'm just such a, a lover of the work you're doing, and, and I see our society and our world today, I was thinking about like we are made of the past, we don't know what the future holds, but in this present, there's some really important work to do, and I'm really honored to be able to do it with all y'all. Thank you. future without a past? How can we a future without a present? So talk about a future as nonsense, unless there's a memory of what went wrong back then, so we won't repeat the mistakes as we are doing today. With our final Turkle Award this evening, we debut a new category, and it's called the Ripple Effect Award. And this award goes to a journalist who is not based in Chicago but whose work has made an impact on this city and beyond. No question that the New York Times' Nicole Hannah-Jones has done just that with the 1619 Project. The New York Times Magazine project she spearheaded, that's designed to bridge the distance between what little we often learn about slavery in this country, the truth about it, and its legacy. Uh, you know the saying, the truth shall set you free? Well, the 1619 Project is exceptionally freeing, and it works to set the record straight in print, in an audio series, a podcast, and in a school curriculum. It's a project full of captivating, thought-provoking, and sometimes disturbing essays and stories, plus some really powerful poetry that will take your breath away. Simply put, it's a historic reframing of history. And the depth of the project and Nicole's work has sparked conversations in social circles all across this city and beyond. It's inspired youth and adults to lead and to live beyond one of the great travesties of America. The 1619 Project is an example of the power of journalism, and that is a testament to the spirit of studs. So please welcome the recipient of the Ripple Effect Award, Nicole Hanajo. So I'm just going to say I was so shocked when Jamira messaged me because I know about this award and I follow it every year because the types of journalists who get these awards are the type of journalists who I value, who are telling real people's stories and not just the stories of the powerful. And I was like, this has to be a mistake. Clearly, I'm not a Chicagoan. Um, so just thank you for an honor. Um, I know a lot of people say they are humbled by awards and it may not come off as, as true, but I truly am honored to be here. I know that uh, Janice Jackson was supposed to be the one to give me this award tonight. And <laughs> for obvious reasons, 
that did not happen, but I still do want to shout out the fact that um, she had the vision to be uh, make Chicago Public Schools the first school district in the country where every single high school is teaching the 1619 Project curriculum. <laughs> And I can tell you, you know, as a child who grew up feeling completely demeaned by the way we were taught the history of slavery and the history of black people in this country, the power of the head of a district, one of the largest in the country, saying that our children are going to learn a different history is really, really important. And hopefully um, our children can grow up with a different sense of themselves and a sense of, of feeling empowered and not ashamed. With that said, I also um, want to acknowledge Chicago Public Schools teachers who are on strike today. Um, I come from a long line of union activists. My mom was president of her local uh, chapter of AFSCME. Um, I grew up in union halls, and I understand how important it is and how uh, going in. Deciding that you want to strike is often a last resort, but sometimes a necessary resort, so I want to hold up all the teachers for trying to advocate on behalf of our children. Uh, I would also like to thank Public Narrative, obviously, for um, giving me this honor and creating an award that would allow a New Yorker to come into Chicago. Um, <laughs> I'm thankful it wasn't a, an existing award because that would feel a little weird because there's so many Chicago journalists who deserve to be honored. I appreciate the judges for creating this, all the other journalists tonight whose powerful work is being honored, and also just quickly um, would like to thank the Invisible Hands who prepared the food that we all ate tonight who set up this room. I come from those invisible hands. My grandmother um, migrated up north and did what black women had to do. She was a domestic, she cleaned people's houses, she was a janitor, and I've always remembered how people would walk past her as if she didn't matter, um, even as she was making the spaces for them nice, and so I think it's important to always acknowledge those folks. So I'm just a girl from Waterloo. I grew up about four hours from here. I came on the exact same migration that brought most of the black people in this room here, the Illinois Central that took black folks from Mississippi up north hoping to find a promised land. Uh, I always say my people were so country we got off the train a little too early and that's why I'm not a Chicagoan. <laughs> Waterloo was the big city to us. We didn't know that we should go a little further. Um, but, but for that, I probably would be a Chicagoan because our people are the same people. And I became obsessed with the year 1619 as a high school student when I first came across that date in a book by Lerone Bennett called Before the Mayflower. I was taking the one semester black history course that my high school offered, and it was like I was seeing my world for the first time. My entire life I had been taught that our history could be summed up in the two paragraphs that they needed to explain the Civil War. And suddenly in this class, I was exposed to volumes and volumes of literature and history about black people and the black experience. And once I started to read, you couldn't tell me anything. I felt empowered for the first time in my life, and I remember on page 28 of that book when I read 1619 and I realized that we had actually been here before the Mayflower, that we had been here longer than almost any other group, and I instantly understood why we were never taught that. Because to teach that is to have to face a different legacy about who we want to be and who we want to think we are as a country. <clears throat> So I've been obsessed with that date really since high school. And as the anniversary of the 400th year was approaching, I just kept thinking, this is probably one of the most momentous anniversaries in our country and it's going to pass in most American household and no one is gonna know that this anniversary exists, no one is going to commemorate it and it's going to pass like so much of our history. And I realized that I was in a position at a place like the New York Times to do something about that, that I had not only an opportunity, but a mandate as a black woman working in the New York Times to not allow this anniversary to simply pass as if it did not matter, as if it was not one of the most consequential moments in the story of America. And I was thinking, what would it mean to have the most important journalistic organization in the world to tell this story? and to tell a story that is not simply a history, but a story that centers the legacy of slavery and the enslaved and those who have always been considered on the bottom, and to reframe 
not just our understanding of black Americans, but our understanding of America itself. And so I came back from book leave telling myself I need to be low key because I didn't finish this damn book, <laughs> which I still haven't finished. And within a week, I go in and I pitch to my editor this radical reframing, arguing that American, that slavery is central to the American story, not marginal as we're taught, that 1619 is as important to who we are and who we become as Americans as the year 1776, and that we, I wanted to do a project that would show that those who have always been considered the least in this country, those who have been considered the least American, were actually the most American of all because we believed in this country when the the founders did not. And I pitched this to my editor, Elena Silverman, and then to the editor-in-chief of the magazine, Jake Silverstein. And people have constantly asked me, what kind of pushback did you get? And I have to say, amazingly, surprisingly, it must have been you know, the intervention of the ancestors. I received none, not a second, not a beat. And he said, let's do this. And I was pitching that we would take over an entire issue of the magazine and dedicate it to nothing but telling our stories, and to tell those stories in a way that was unflinching and courageous, and that we weren't going to try to tell these stories in a way to make white people feel good. We were going to try to tell these stories in a way that was truthful. From that idea of a single issue of the magazine, the project just grew and grew and grew out of control. I say I, edged, I aged in presidential years working on this project. You can't tell because I color my hair, but. It grew from being an issue of the magazine to an entire section of the newspaper to a podcast to live events and who the hell knows what else because it's kind of gotten out of control. But we could write about slavery every day for the next 10 years and never cover all of the stories and the impact that needs to be told. The 1619 Project, to me, shows what happens when you tackle as journalists the most difficult stories without fear when you respect your readers, when you don't feel you have to water down the stories to make them palatable to anyone, when you use language that is unflinching, and when you use as the starting point the point of view, and you state that point of view. We were explicit that we were reframing history. We were explicit that we were going to treat those who have been on the bottom as those who have been on the top. And when you do that with rigorous scholarship and attempt, as John Hope Franklin said, to tell the unvarnished truth, that readers will come and they will consume and they will want that, that there is a desire and a thirst for this type of truth telling. And so in this 400th year, 1619, the 1619 Project to me is a testament of what happens, not only when we hire black and Latino and Asian and Native American journalists, but when we actually empower them to do the work that they got into journalism to do. Because it doesn't matter if we're in those rooms, if we can't do the work that we came here to do. And I can tell you, my girlfriend, Melissa, who's in the front row knows, none of this was inevitable. Seven years ago, I nearly left the industry. I was being punished and penalized in my newsroom because I ever, all I ever wanted to write about was black folks. And no one ever cared that white journalists wrote about white people every day, but it was a problem when a black journalist wanted to write about black people. Unfortunately, I couldn't think of anything else I'd rather do besides journalism, so I stuck it out. <laughs> That's why I'm here, and I can tell you I take a great deal of satisfaction from seeing my former editors who tried to hold me down now that I am where I am. <laughs> <laughs> We have to not only hire diversity. Diversity is not about tokenism. Diversity is not about being politically correct or feeling good. It's literally about are we going to do journalism that is accurate and true and that actually covers our communities or not. And you have to not just hire people but empower them to tell the stories that only we can tell and give us the resources that we need to actually tell those stories. In the 1619 Project, Nearly every essay, all the original art, all of the photography, and all of the creative works were done by black folks. All of it. We have sold out of two print runs on that. We haven't seen this type of um, demand for a print product since Obama was elected in his historic election in 2008. We have 30,000 people on a waiting list right now trying to get a copy of the 1619 Project, and it was a project entirely created by black folks. What this tells you 
is that if you give us the resources and you give us the room and you trust us to tell these stories, that you can produce the most excellent journalism in this country and you need to stop stymieing those journalists who want and can do this work because if we create it, people will come. <clears throat> My hope is that with the 1619 Project and what we have been able to do with the 1619 Project, that this work will make it easier for the next journalist of color who wants to do something radical and big to convince their editors to give them the room and the space and the resources to do this work and support and the trust that is necessary. And most of all, when I think about this, I didn't know when I started out that this would be the most important work of my life. I didn't know how many times I would cry producing this and what it felt to sit in the pain of, of what our people had to endure. And so I hope above all that I have made our ancestors proud and I dedicate the award tonight to those first 20 to 30 ancestors who landed on these shores 400 years ago and suffered what they did and for the millions who would come after them, who suffered what they did, so that we may be here and that we may live. And I will be forever in their service. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, tonight is surreal. Studs and I never crossed paths, but I've had the chance to meet him in every interview and documentary recorded, or the stories about Studs shared by the journalists who knew him best. Whether it was 2013 Turkle winner Dave Hoekstra, who's made mention of Studs' love of Mahalia Jackson, or 2015 Turkle winner Monica Ng, whose Studs' impression is spot on, you have to have her do it for you. I hate to put you on the spot, Monica. <laughs> stories have not only kept public narrative, formerly community media workshop, alive, but its storytellers have written to build a stronger democracy. And it's their great service to this city that has helped us to serve as the bridge between journalists and community. Will all the past Studs Turkle winners please stand? Let's give them a round of applause. Some of you may not know, but he is more than just the name on, this, on our awards. Studs was our mentor. He chose the awards for years and handed out the awards up until the year before he died. Everything we do tonight is to keep his work alive because Studs changed journalism. He was an important storyteller, activist, author, as well as a conscience for Chicago. He brought to life the people of this city, and he believed telling stories was the highest calling any of us could have. He took great delight in, say in saying he wasn't a journalist, yet he called his oral histories guerrilla journalism. All our work is based on the pedagogy of Studs Terkel, because the beauty of what Studs did was Studs listened. He got people to think, and he got people talking. The more I immerse myself in this organization, the more I'm convinced that my own story has been preparing me to lead public narrative into its future. Public narrative is a place for media makers and media consumers. We are capacity builders who, are, who provide communications training to journalism outlets, community organizations, educational institutions, and service agencies. Our work includes exposing youth to a world beyond themselves through our curriculum, teaching them to become active contributors in our democracy. All of these factors have focused our work to highlight media and community needs within the frame of health, safety, and education. I would like at this time, um, some of our community partners are actually present, uh, partners from the Bronzeville community, if you all would stand. Kelsey and Kahari, if you all are still here. Um, as well as Jen and Rebecca. <laughs> so
So presently, Public Narrative is uh, collaborating on two very significant projects. Um, one led by the Bronzeville Partners around uh, Dr. Joy DeGruy's work on post-traumatic slave syndrome. And it's uh, Be the Healing. You guys, we have all your email addresses, so you'll get more information about it. But the training is happening in December, and it's a, it's a work that's very near and dear to us, um, as well as a project that we're heading up with uh, the Alliance for Research in Chicagoland Communities with um, a group out of Northwestern. Uh, this particular group works to take research and medical uh, medical research, health industry research, and apply it to communities. And we're working together very diligently to bring it to journalists so that journalists then can bring it to the communities so that we can end medical disparities in communities. Thank you all for standing. So all of these factors have focused our work to highlight media and community needs within the frame of health, safety, and education. With this lens, we can leverage resources, information, and access balancing the public narrative. Before I take my seat, I want to invite to the stage Ms. Sylvia Ewing. Susie introduced Sylvia and I on my birthday this year. So she's been a beautiful birthday present to me. I got a chance to spend some time with Sylvia in Austin, Texas, and it was just the most phenomenal moment, uh, moments of my life. I've known her, yes. <laughs> She's a wealth of information, and she just goes to show that when you open the door for someone and they soak up the information that you share, just how far they can go. I've known her for a short time, but as I said, she's been a tremendous gift and thought partner. Thank you. All right, all right. What a night. Uh, give yourselves an applause for being at the right place at the right time. So, block the doors, lock the doors. Like Jamira said, we've only known each other for a short time. Earlier this month, uh, earlier this month, I got to see her in action, filling in wherever she could, helping, networking, connecting with people, strategizing and acting on those strategies. I've said I am a door opener, not a gatekeeper. But when you open the door, not everyone knows how to walk through. She is a very impressive young woman. I asked, uh, so when she asked if I would do the ask, I said, sure, I'll ask for money for you. Those of you who know my background understand how much I appreciate the connectivity and the sustainability that is a measure of success. It's not just what you do, it's who did you teach, who did you bring, who did you leave behind, which replacement did you grow? Those of you who've opened doors for others to walk through know if you want those people to make good on the opportunities given, you've got to help them. I spent enough time with Jamara to know that when the doors open, not only will she make good of the opportunity, but she's strategic enough to know how it works in the favor of others. We need to rally behind leaders like Jamira, not just in spirit and with words and good cheer, but with our dollars. Invest in what you believe in. You heard her vision, now let's pay for it. I was uh, lucky enough to work at WBEZ and we knew when our colleague who produced for Studs Late in Life was talking with him, because she would be loud, because he couldn't hear. And we knew if she was yelling, she was speaking with Studs. His voice still carries with us and in the work that you do, in the work that you do. So what does that mean to you? Put a dollar amount on it. There are folks here that are going to collect your money. There's a card in your basket. I'm gonna go Jesse Jackson style. How many people here can give 200 bucks? Raise your hand. How many people can give 100, 50, 25? Think about what you're investing in. There are people who are gonna make it easy for you. I see that box coming up the stairs. Put your card in it, put your donation in it. Think about what you're investing in. Because it's not just having a person of color at the helm. Is it the right person? I worked, I guess maybe 14 years ago with someone who was an African American leader and I was so excited to work with him. And when he didn't move fast enough for me, 
I said, we got to do more. And he said, Sylvie, it's their world, meaning the majority folks, meaning old white men. And I said, well, we have to break a piece off. Well, Jamira and all of these honorees are doing more than breaking off a piece of the world. They are taking over in an area where it's needed. Let's see a show of hands of people who are going to give some money. Let's see, raise your hand now. I know your mom, thank you. I know your dad, I know your daughter. You know, I grew my replacement Eve Ewing. I know Ida B. Wells inspired uh, Nicole. So it's the, the continuum from Lerome to Ida B. Wells to you. We saw those hands, keep them raised high. Let's have this uh, happen. And I'm gonna just leave you with a thought. These are the worst of times when we look at our environment, but these are the best of times. And strong people, with goodwill to work together can overcome anything. So thank you very much, and I saw you, I know you. I know you, your kids, your grandparents. Thank you for your help. So you see the monitors. You can text to give. We also have um, a rave of wave. So Moreva has some envelopes for you guys to give your donations, okay? At this time, we are gonna have, in true studs tradition, where's Corky? Where's Corky? Okay, all right. Let's have Corky to the stage to lead us in This Land Is Your Land. This land is your land. This land is my land. From California to the Red Island. From the Redwood Forest to the Gulf Stream waters. This land was made for you and me. You guys know the words to that. I have them all written out. Here's this one, then he said, as I went walking that ribbon highway, I saw above me that endless skyway. I saw below me the golden valley. This land was made for you and me. And then he, he threw this one is because he always was very spontaneous and he would make up other lyrics and other verses for the moment for the situation and then he did this one as I was walking I saw a sign there and on the sign it said no trespassing 
But on the other side, it didn't say nothing. Now that side was made for you and me. So then I thought if he was here tonight, both Studs and Woody and Pete Seeger, uh, I, I was thinking maybe they would say this. I see the goodness cut through the darkness. I see the goodness cut through the dark shade. The precious free press shining its light. I see the truth, the journalist's beacon, the fourth estate will never fade. So now you could sing. This land is your land. This land is my land. From California to the New York I Land is my for you. Let's do it one more time. What the heck? This land is your land. This land is my California to the New York Islands. To the Gulf Stream waters. This land is made for you and me.